perhaps most of what we believe, but because they had a different label. Uh, and because of that, there are some, because they're not as uh, it's said in the Gospels, like the John and James, Lord, they're on the other side of the road. Do you want us to, uh, why don't we just call down you know, lightning upon them and just do away with them? And, and the Lord cleared that up to let them know that they weren't against what was happening on this side of the road. Uh, and if they are not, that they are for him. The church didn't start off like that. Now, there are several reasons why we are where we are. Paul made it clear that after his departure, grievous wolves would enter in among the church, not sparing the flock. They'll come in, it'll be a pact for every generation to have to deal with throughout the church age. And then from among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, drawing disciples away after themselves. Now, if you think for one moment that God is pleased with a denomination or any denomination that would take away from his glory, his honor, and from what we have in Scripture, we, we have another thing coming. And I know that there are some who make their boast, you know, in a label. And, but Christ died for the sins of the world that he would have one church. And that's how the church started. But beyond the wolves that have attack the church over the ages and the ambitious men there are some things that the church that at that time and I would say even with us that we haven't done to maintain the unity of the spirit it is the spirit of God who is responsible for the unity of the church how on earth can you have one church with one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is above all, over all, and through all, and yet we are so divided? I think we've covered the ground between what Paul said by the spirit would happen and the things that we have failed to do. So in what we've read, this is how the church began, and this is the template of the church. This is how the church should be operating even now. There should be the oneness factor. Now, when we go over here to where we have been for the Lord knows how long, in verse 20, uh, but ye have not so learned Christ, and so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore you put off you put on, and now this is what the church is supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be putting away, and we, we, we covered this, but put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Who is his neighbor? Anyone that he can help not hurt, do good and not evil, but his neighbor is going to be a brother or sister. It's in the text. For we are members, look at this, we are members. Think of the natural body, but think about the body of Christ. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil, let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now, 
when Christ had his disciples to gather around him before he went to Calvary's cross in John chapter 13 uh, John chapter 13 he has been betrayed by Judas and now Judas is about to go out and to get the band together to come and to arrest him. And then here in verse 31, therefore when he, Judas, was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him little children we've heard this language somewhere by one of his own his apostle john little children yet a little while i'm with you ye shall seek me and as i said unto the jews whither i go ye cannot come so now i say to you a new commandment I give unto you. Now this is found in Leviticus 19, and we're going to look at that, but this is a new commandment, but, but, it, but it's not new, but it's new. He's given to them new. That ye love one another, but listen at this. You love one another as I have loved you. That's big. That's not any old kind of love. And when they heard these words, like what was said in this house on Sunday, they realized that if he's charging us to love one another, and this is the word of God, we have to make sure that we love God first with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That cannot be omitted. It can't be. By this. And this is the issue we have in the world. You want to know why folk are not. Uh, but they don't get in a hurry to hear the gospel. Or they seem to have the time to want to hear the gospel. They don't see the church. For what the church. Is. And is supposed to be in the world. The press on the church should be this. The world should say, we do not agree with their doctrine. Many of them, we don't like them, and we don't even know why. But they have this thing about them, is that they love one another. You don't hear them bickering back and forth with one another. They are one. Has the world seen this? Yes. The world saw this in the early church. Guess what? The world is not seeing it today in the latter church. Because you want to know something? The verse of scripture that talked about these perilous times talked about that men would be lovers of their own selves. We have the denominations. We have more flavors than the ice cream people when it comes to church. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Well, read it this way. If you don't love one another, they are not going to make the connection that you are my disciples. How many know the world is not making that connection? If you have love one for another, not any old kind of love, you've got to love one another like I love you. You can't love any less, and I don't expect you to love your neighbor any more than I loved you. And 
John 14. Like I said, we big on saying we love the Lord. But we can't have love that is covenantal love without parameters and guidelines. How many times have you told someone that you love them and you know, you know, down in your nor, down in your will that you did not love them? We've all done it. Guilty. 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 We're all guilty of it. But it has to stop. It has to. Because when we stand before him, the only thing that's going to matter at that time is what we've done in the body at this time. If there's someone that we don't love with the love of Christ, we've got to get that straight in and of ourselves. And if we've got an issue with God, we got to get it straight so that we be true men and women of God. He says in 15, if you love me, who is he speaking to? His audience is his own. Those men which his father gave him. But it means no less to us. You still have to keep my commandments. Now, turn, if you would, back to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to see these disciples, even though they were perplexed and they were scared and terrified and they had questions and concerns, and they had doubt and they had unbelief. But I truly believe that these men, that Christ soothed, it is, Christ soothed all of their doubts, removed their unbelief, so that they can now be poised for the mission to which they were called. In Luke 24, Christ appears to them. They're shut up in this room. And he just appears out of thin air. They're terrified. He greets them and then he asks for some food. And then in here, verse 44, this is worthy of reading. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. It's all about him. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And beloved, that ought to be our prayer. Lord, open my understanding as you open the scriptures. Now, I want to say this to you, and maybe we don't say it enough around here today. Make notes if you have questions about something that was covered, if something was not given to you clearly. You need to know the truth. You need to be armed with the truth of God's word. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, thus it behoove Christ. And he's speaking concerning himself. himself. It behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. They heard this before, but this is on the other side of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is on the other side of their doubt and unbelief in the Lord appearing to them with his nail prints in his hand. He says, but I'm going to send the promise of my Father upon you. But this is what you have to do. But you have to tarry. You have to stay ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Remember, Christ is speaking directly to them. 
And they are going to take his word. And they are going to do exactly what Messiah, King, Christ, Lord said. And this is how we have to approach whatever he tells us. Because you're going to see how they respond to him once he's removed from out of their presence, it's as if he's still there. Oh my God. They watch him leave. As a matter of fact, look at verse 50. And we seldom read this on Resurrection Sunday. But this is so beautiful. Look at what he does. He told them, you got to stay in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. This work, you cannot do it without the Spirit of God. The other thing is, he promised them that I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. But that was a period of time when he was accessible to them, but they wouldn't know it. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. Can't you see it? And he lifted up his hands and he blessed all of them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And Acts, it was a cloud that received him. And he went up, up, and he went up, up and away. And notice what happened with them. Notice what they did in his absence. They worshiped him. He, but he gone. He's gone into glory. But they worshiped him. What did they do? They internalized the worth of Christ to them, what he meant to them, and all of his wholeness, and all of what he had done, and all of what he was doing, and, and bless God and all of what he would do. They worshiped him. It was authentic worship, perhaps not even with a lot of words. Love this. And they worship him. And see, the Spirit is letting us know that this took place before the praising started. Do, do we know how to worship him? You see, but we sing the hymns. Is that worship? That's singing. We pray prayers. Now, I believe there's an aspect of worship in communicating with him. But worship is when we get low in his presence. What did Satan tell us? Not that we need to be taking any lessons from him, but he, he told Christ to bow down and worship him. It's, it's not a sitting up kind of posture that we're just sitting and looking, you know, like we had at a movie theater and we're just going to be there and we're going to take notes. And No, it's where you go inward and you recognize the, the person of Jesus Christ, all that you can call to memory concerning Christ as to who he is, what he's done, what he's doing and what he's going to do. They worshiped. These men went from, remember these are his disciples. These are his. Judas is gone. These are his disciples. They went from doubt and unbelief to, into worship. But it took the Lord Jesus to bring them to the place where they could. And they worshiped him. And he didn't leave them as orphans. But they worshiped him as if he was there. And beloved, it would do us good here on the Lord's day. Or whenever the hinges on that door swing with the door going away, it's to worship him. And just get along with him. And we're in his presence. And all we can think about is him. We lose sight.
sight of time. Because as in turning to eternity and all of our future, we lose sight of who's around us because we're going to be in the host of the heavenly host. We lose sight of this old world because one day this old world is going to pass away. That old dragon is going to be done away. This old flesh is going to fall away. We're going to be in his presence. We're going to be in the presence of almighty God. We're going to be in the presence of the Lamb of God. Don't you want to meet your creator? See him? Look, your eyes were put in those sockets to see Christ. And all of his regalia, not with these things, but with those new eyes. Amen. That's wired, hardwired by God for eternity, that you would be able to do it within a new body. That we might worship him. What are we going to do in glory? We're going to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're going to worship the Lamb. We're going to bow down. We're going to stand. We're going to walk with him. And by golly, we're going to talk with him. We're going to listen at him for heaven's sake. They worship him. They worship him. They worship him. It appears that they worship him. And the and says, and return to Jerusalem with great joy. So what happened after worship? Great joy. <laughs> so back in Jerusalem, and we're continually in the temple. But he gone. Spirit hadn't been given. They just took the last thing Christ said, committed it to themselves. Everyone committed it to themselves. And, and this, I, I brought you here to see that these men were responsible for laying the foundation of the church, the teaching that we have, the preaching that we preach. Now I want you to look at how we deal with Christ whom we can't see. Our worship that should lead to great joy and praising in the temple. That's usually a lot to be desired when you compare it to this. And notice this in verse 53. And we're continually in the temple praising and blessing. Lord, we need. Lord, please give us. Please, Lord, we need this and we need that. They were blessing God in the temple. Hmm. Let's go over to Acts. Acts chapter one. So we've gotten somewhat of a bird's eye view. Let's see if we can't get a little closer to where the action is. Now you remember the last time the Lord told Peter and James and John to do something. Of course, he separated them from the others and told them to uh, watch and so you know what's going to happen with what he's told them to do as far as you go and you stay in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high you already know what they're going to be doing in verse 9 well let's back into this we'll, we'll just uh, so that we get all of what uh Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, this is Christ, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? 
But he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be my witnesses. Uh, ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. And these men are still witnesses. Uh, and we have their testimony. And this is what we've been teaching. Uh, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud and received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Then return they into, unto Jerusalem. And we already know that there's some, uh, Luke has filled this in. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room and abode with Peter, hmm, James, and John. Andrew and Peter and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continue, and this is it. They continue. Remember, they were one with Christ even before he led them out there to Bethany. And look at this. They were one. These all continued with one accord. This is one purpose. One purpose of mine. They had only one agenda. There were no hidden agendas. They continued one accord in prayer and supplications with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now let's fast forward all the way into the church. Let's go to chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4. And this is prior to the incident with Ananias and Sapphira. That was unity with the apostles of Christ. There was unity with those that were added to the church. 3,000 souls in verse 41 of chapter 2. What, the, what kept brought this unity about, they continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. They were one. Not, you didn't have Baptists, you didn't have Presbyterians, you didn't have Methodists. You had one church because there's only one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. But in chapter 4, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart. And of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Now, how do we, let's see if we can't transition back to our responsibility when it comes to this big job that God does through us by the Holy Ghost. When his love has been shed abroad in our hearts, that we are to love one another. In Ephesians, when we see the putting off of the old behavior in favor of putting on the new man, then there are things that we have to put away because if we don't put those things away, we'll be working with the grievous wolves, we'll be working with the ambitious men, and we will divide the church and fracture the church because we will have sin in our lives. Now, in Leviticus 19, and this is where we're going to spend uh, the rest of our time here together, and you'll see the same language that has been given to the church. And I think that we made a case from Scripture that because we are in the 
olive tree. And make no mistake about it, this olive tree has everything to do with the person of Jesus Christ. He is the seed of David. He is the promised seed of Abraham. Leviticus 19, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto, now when, you, when I read this, I, I, I read it and then I look at the time in which they were living, I recognize this is, these are Hebrew people, and I'm not Hebrew. But speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel. All right, now if you were children of Israel, you had to be accessible for Moses to speak to you. In other words, you couldn't say that I'm part of Israel, but yet you have nothing to do with the congregation. Like I told you, my former pastor used to see people in Walmart. People walk up to him and say, hey, pastor, you got, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, you're my pastor. And my pastor, he's, he's dumbfounded because he doesn't know the individual. It's because they may have grew up in the church, they may have joined the church, but they don't have any part of the church. Nothing. Israel had to, up to this point right here, we're in Leviticus now. When we get to Joshua, there were some things that took place. But, but up to this point, all of the congregation meant everybody that was with Moses. And if you weren't with Moses, well, then you were not considered to be a part of the congregation. I don't care what you said. I don't even care what Moses said. And you say unto them, look at this. Ye shall be holy. Now, I question this. I'm not questioning the Lord. I'm just questioning what I read. I'm not questioning because I already had answer. The Lord, you expecting them to be holy, but they don't even have the Holy Ghost? The same way the Lord expected, although he know, knew in his omniscience, he expected when he said, Moses, you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. That word was enough. All Pharaoh had to do was just release the people. He expected him to do it, even though he knew he wouldn't do it. Because God's word is not going to return unto him, but it's going to accomplish what he sent it forth to accomplish. I'm reminded of Nineveh. Nineveh did not have the spirit of God. But the word that Jonah didn't want to preach, finally got around to preaching after his mind was changed. It's amazing what a rough boat ride and being swallowed by a big old fish and being vomited up and coming out looking like only God knows what he looked like, maybe seaweed wrapped around his head. He went on and started preaching, but he didn't want to. But that same word saved Nineveh in that season. People talk about like the word of God is not enough. The word of God, if you act on it, and God expects everyone to respond to his word. God is not just telling folk, well, I'm going to suggest you do it. No, every time he speaks, God is binding himself. He's, he's a strong one who binds with an oath. So when he says something, it will come to pass. And when he speaks, he's expecting something to happen. It's just like when my grandmother would call me in the morning. Boy, come on down here. Breakfast is ready. And I could tell because the smoke had got up there. Because she, she, you know, cooking on that old wood stove and wood, half wood and gas. And, uh, and she cooked. And when she finished cooking, it was done. It was done. And, uh, but I would go back to sleep. But when she called me, she was expecting me to move, man. She wasn't expecting to have to come up there and get me out of the bed. And God was not my grandmother. Was not my grandmother. God expect movement when he speak. Like, I watch folk lay down on God after he done spoke. I, I watch folk get an attitude with the Lord after he done told us what to do. He's expecting these people. Ye shall be holy. And here's why. For I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Go over to verse number 11. Listen to what he says. You shall not steal. Well, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. 
Let him that stole steal no more. We're going to work with our hands. And, and, and what that scripture says, those of us who have stolen, and all of us have, and, and Zach, it was Zacchaeus, he had taken some stuff, and he paid back with a fifth part. But the scripture in Ephesians 4 and 28 says, let him that stole steal no more, he's to work with his hand that he may have to give to those who are in need. So he's not just to say, well, I'm going to go do what I can do for my house. No, you thief. You used to be a thief. You need more to give to somebody else in need. We don't want to do this, but this is what the Word of God says. Oh, we Word of God, people. We believe in the Word. Okay, how many of us are doing this? How many of us want to be a part of this? No, it's just me and mine. Ye shall not steal. Now, you remember this kind of came about, the Sunday's message came about because of a conversation we had after the broadcast about the law. Now, stealing and stealing. And remember what Paul said about the Gentiles that didn't even have the law, but the work of the law was like it was written on the heart to know that if I take what belongs to someone else, that's wrong. If I take someone else's wife, that's wrong. If I kill you, it's wrong unless it's self-defense. It, it was just written on the heart. And, and though they don't, didn't have the law, but we want, we, we want this sloppy agape where, Lord, I love you. All right. Do you love me with your whole heart? Do you love me with all your soul? Do you love me with all your mind? Do you love me with all your strength? And somewhere along the way, we're going to find a place where, hmm, Lord, I don't believe I love you like that. Then you're going to find out you might just have a God in your life that's not God. You might have an idol that's in the way. Dennis, y'all don't have to put your name down. I don't mind putting my name there. But I know I got some kin folk in hell. And I'm there too. We don't like him like that. But why would he require that? I ride around at night. I, I, I tell you, when I, when I see the sky, I think about the second coming of Christ. I see the clouds. I know he's coming back with clouds. I see the road. I think about that he's the way, the truth, and the life. I see trees, I think about the cross. When I see, whatever I see, when, when I consider sin, sin costs man everything. Amen. Man, it put us in debt. And that will be folk going to go out of this world where Christ has paid their sin debt, but they will not believe until after a while, because everyone's going to believe. Everybody's going to believe the gospel. Y'all think I'm making it up? The rich man believed the gospel after he ended up in hell because he wanted Lazarus to go back. Everyone's going to believe. You drink your beer, smoke your cigar, ride around, profile and style. Oh yeah, you dressing now, you looking like, but everyone's going to believe the gospel. Listen, you need to repent because Christ died for your sins on the tree. Can't you see the blood dried on his face, all around his neck? How they beat him? They beat him till they got tired of whipping him. They went home and talked about how they whipped him. And they talked to the loved ones about it. Can you imagine? Can't you imagine looking at your hands after you slap him and you hit him and you, you spit on him and go home and look at your hands and look at your mouth that he made. Ask Malchus. Malchus had his ear cut off by Peter because Peter got over in the flesh. Because rather than watch and pray, Peter did what we are doing, sleeping our, way, uh, just sleeping our life away. Sleeping our life away. So what did he do? He whips out his sword. Man, you don't need to whip out your sword. This is Bible prophecy unfolding. Get out of the way. Get out of Christ's way. 
You're not going to stop this, and you're not going to help him. But Peter, what he, do? he whips out his sword, and he swings, and he's going for Malchus' neck, or anybody else is in the way, because he's coming after Christ. Now, I can appreciate that up to a point, but Peter dead wrong. And he takes a swipe, and he comes up with Malchus' ear. His ear is gone. It's not on his side of his head no more. Now, Christ got a lot of things to do. He got to go from judgment hall to judgment hall. They're going to lie on him. They're going to tell all kinds of falsehoods on him. But on his way, he, now look at this. He got to clean up a mess that Peter done made. He takes Malchus' ear, puts it back on the side of his head. And I bet you Malchus every day rubbed his ear side of his head every day of his life. I wonder what happened to Malchus. I often wonder what happened to Malchus. Did Malchus lose heart for the band of soldiers and run home to his mama? Did he run home to his wife? Or did he stay there and tucked it out and went home and wept all night long? Who knows what happened to Malchus? But I do know one thing. He put Malchus' ear on. But the same one in whom you are actually, you despise him. You hate his word. You hate preachers. He's your creator. He created you. You don't have no life. You don't have no breath. He is your length of days. Christ Jesus. Mary's baby, but God's son. You need to repent of your sins today. You need to repent now of your sins. Amen. Now, you shall not steal. God's talking to his people. He's talking to the congregation. Now, here's the thing about it. I don't know if you realize this. When Noah preached, Noah preached to his family. I posted something like this on Facebook. How many, how many drowned, or how many wish they had believed the preaching of their cousin Noah while they were drowning? All of them. Noah preached to his own people. Because everybody was kin, related. Noah was leading who? His own family out. Moses was leading who out of Egypt? His own people. Christ came to die. He's the kinsman. He's our kinsman redeemer. Specifically for Israel, but he's ours also because there's a Gentile in his, in his line. In the flesh. With Rahab. He preached to his own people. You better believe what your cousin preached. You better believe what Christ preached. The kinsman redeemer. That's who he is. He's your kinfolk. Now, a few more points that we're done. He says, neither deal falsely. Now this means, this word falsely, is to remember who they're going to be dealing with. Because they're not, they're not going to be dealing with the other nations because they're going to stay to themselves. Don't you deceive your brothers. Don't hoodwink them. That's what this word falsely means. deceive himself. Well, why did Ananias and Sapphira want to deceive Peter? For the praise. We are to be true men and women. And if we're going to do any deceiving, before we do it, 
check in with the Lord and say, Lord, I got this on my heart. I, I want to be free of this. I don't want to see my brother. I don't want to mislead him. I don't want him to think one thing. I don't want to put, put your head is, I don't want to misdirect him. That's what this means. Neither deal falsely with your brother. One another, but this going to be your brother. And look at this. Neither lie one to another. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Put away lying from among you. Speak the truth, every man to his neighbor, because you are one of another. So do you see the correlation that is, this is more than a love relationship? It is not. It's love with boundaries, and it's governed by the word of God. Drop down to verse 15. 15 is all about just being righteous. God expected his people to be righteous. Why? You with me. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You're not going to be impartial. You're not going to show respect to persons. And I'm going to say this. I can't think of one church I've been to, not one church that I haven't seen this. It comes out. I, I, I don't know what it is about what we see and we think. And, and there's a reason why the Spirit lets us know so that when that time comes, that we can go back to the Word of God and say, we're supposed to treat everyone with honor and respect. This is what he, and this is, he's going to explain what he's talking about when it comes to judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness thou shalt judge thy neighbor. Turn to James. James chapter 2. Y'all getting anything out of this? Because I'm working on a pretty good sweat up here. <laughs> and verse, that this is something that pastors have to be weary of. Because it's easy to do. Favoritism. That favorite name. But, but James is not dealing with it from that. But this is something we, we have to be careful of. My brethren, in verse 1, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Do you see how he's setting this thing up? He's the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Mm. In other words, every creature that's in glory, not that one that has access to still Satan, but when they see him, they're on their P's and Q's in worship and praise. And his word is the beckoning call. Lord, what would you have me to do for you? That's the view you got to take in here. It's the Lord of glory. What God has revealed. With respect of persons, and that being partiality. Now, from the pastoral part, it could be because a member that has a lot of education, a member that has a lot of money, a member that has a big family, and they're influential. 
they're connected to society and places where you want to be connected. And men, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, listen, listen. It doesn't matter who they're connected to. They're no better than the saint that doesn't even want to lift up his or her head in the service. Because here's the deal, as my president would say. Here's the deal. Other folks see it. Other folk hear how we talk to those in whom we esteem. Hey, how you doing? Uh, hey. Oh, so good to see you today. <laughs> you back again? Hey, good to see. You. That's I'm seeing. I've seen it happen, man. And it turns my stomach the same way it turns the Lord's stomach. And to be honest with you, some of those were the grand rascals. They were the ones that didn't have no interest in the things of God. None. James lays it out. Here's, here's the case. For there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel. And there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. This is just, he's shabby and he's dirty. And I've heard this said on, on a, a couple occasions. We don't want the shabby, the off the street type in our church. You gotta be kidding me. You know the Lord had to drain the swamp to get me. They don't want them coming in with alcohol and smelling like an old kerosene uh, stove and, and things of that nature and funky and all that kind. Don't want them because we don't want we don't want nobody sitting beside them. We don't know what they might have on them. My God, what has happened to us? And I'm talking about in what they call the so-called black church. We want them all to come hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want them to get saved, born into the kingdom of God. Dress might be up here, but you get born again, that dress going to come on down. Glory to God. You might be showing yourself to men, but, but you give your life to Christ. All you want to do is show yourself to Christ. We need folk who are not saved to come and be born into the kingdom of God. I remember when I used to go up the crossroads and Pastor Kenny would talk about, and this is when his dad was the pastor, and how the men off the street, the drink, the alcohol, the, they go, you know, guys that look their own skin roll, come and sit on the back of the pew, man. I want that here. Who do we think we are? Come from nothing. I come from nothing. Come from nothing. And without Christ, I am nothing. As I, what did I tell you all? And please put this in your notes about me. I'm the part of nothing apart from Christ that makes nothing nothing. But if we see somebody with a gold ring and he come in and he decked out, he got his fines on. Boy, he got that right suit on. He hooked up from head to toe. He got that hat. He popping. Or the lady, she dressed like she just walked, stepped out of a magazine. You better see some souls. Stop looking at that outward. Amen. And you have respect. And you have respect, you have partiality to him, then wear the gay clothing. And this is the, the magnificent clothing. The, 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 the clothing that just, it speaks. You know, that certain things people put on, and, and all they got to do is put it on, and, and it's going to be kind of hard to, it's going to be hard not to notice them. But you got to notice them and remember the word of God. I told, what did I tell you ladies? Y'all can come in here dressed like Cinderella, all of you. I might look at you. I don't know what kind of facial expression I'm going to have. But I'm not going to tell you about how would you look like. I'm going to leave that business alone, bless God. 
I'm not going to tell you in the parking lot. I'm not going to tell you when you're on the phone talking to me. Because all of you are beautiful. Did you catch that? All. Beautiful. Why wouldn't you be? Christ don't do no shabby work. Let's get this straight. You in Christ, you in beauty. That's it. Beauty. That's him. Glory to God. He is beauty. Let me tell you something. When we see him, are you going to go, oh, you, you, you're not going to be able to believe who you look in there. This is what I believe. Now we're almost done. If he was to appear like he really looked in the flesh, folk would have been drawn to him like, oh, great. gotta go see him. That goes, that man, that preacher. But that was no form, no comeliness. That was anything that was going to draw anybody to Christ outwardly. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here, come on up here, in a good place. Thinking that maybe they're going to be able to give a better offer, maybe. And say to the poor, huh, uh, Stand thou uh, there, or, 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 or sit here, or sit here under my footstool. Can you just go around over there? So we take Usher, Usher, Usher. Take them around over there. <laughs> take, yeah, let all three of them. Yeah, they came together. Take them around over there. But bring him, yeah, let him and her come on up front. Be right over there. Listen to what James had to say about the Spirit. Are you not then partial? This goes back to Leviticus. In yourselves? Uh oh. You're getting ready to look at this righteous judgment and are become judges of evil thoughts. Hearken, my brother, beloved brother, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him? Uh-oh, promised him that love him. You remember the response that the young man gave about loving God? And, you know, you got to keep the commandments. Well, you don't do that until you get saved. But you got to love God. So those who got of this world never got an opportunity to love God because they were never saved. So they're never in Christ. They were never in God. God is love. And God, is only, God can only be loved with his love. Does that make sense? In other words, worldly love can't love him. Now, he, listen, God will respect, like he did with Cornelius, what Cornelius did. But Cornelius still needed to be born into the kingdom of God. Which he had promised to them that love him. But ye have despised the poor. Those that are dressed vile. Do not rich men oppress you? Have you forgotten? And draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme that worship? I, I back up. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which they are called? If ye fulfill the royal law, see, we're right back here again. This is where we are turning. According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now, once again, we can't omit the law. That's good. Father in heaven, we thank you. Sin costs us everything. But not only did it cost us everything, it cost you everything. He gave the only begotten son. You've given your spirit. You've demonstrated your love in a way that it is unmatched, unparalleled, and unprecedented. It cost us everything and it cost you everything. And Lord, help us. 
that in this end time season that those who are under different labels but we have the same core doctrines that we might be able to fellowship together Lord, I, I want to see us the way that you started with the disciples and you started with the 2000 and the 120 and with those who had one mind one heart and they had everything common because they were expecting you to come back to them Jesus Lord help each one of us in our own lives to re revisit Ephesians chapter 4 commit those things to heart that we're supposed to put away and as I believe was pressed into my spirit, the reason why we had gotten off to a rough start in our walk with you is because we started stop going certain things, stop going certain places, and that was the pollution from our old lives, as Dr. McGee would say. But the corruption from the old man, that behavior, we didn't deal with that because we were still lying and stealing and angry and all those things. Now those who are listening to me right now, child of God is angry with his own brother or sister for no good reason. To be angry, bitter, but yet love God. No, that's a lie. Lord, help us. Help me, Lord, and thank you. Thank you, Lord, that I, I didn't do this teaching in Ephesians, the traditional way to just go verse by verse by verse by verse, but we went where we believed we needed to go. We've come to a place, Lord, where we have a better respect for your command, your charge, your word. Thank you for your word. And I pray for those, Lord, who watch this broadcast that are not saved, just mere church children on the way to hell. Lord, I pray that you would convict them the same way you convicted me. That you'd bring that conviction upon them and you'd show them. For as much as when they look in the mirror, they may see themselves, but when they look into your word, they will see what you see. Might they see what you see? Might the spirit be, heart be broken and the spirit crushed under the weight of sin that has yet to be confessed that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And they cried in the heart, what must I do to be saved? And Lord, I know you will save everyone. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Amen.